Welcome everybody to one of our Fire Drill Friday teach-ins. Uh, I'm so glad that we're continuing. I'm not in DC anymore, but uh, we're gonna continue to teach, uh, which I love because guess what? I'm just as much a student as any of you are. Um, I'm particularly excited today that I'm interviewing viewing Sharon Burroughs. Sharon is the Secretary General, the first woman to be Secretary General. Am I right, Sharon? You're the first yeah. woman yeah. to be Secretary General of the International Trade Union Confederation, representing the world's working people with 207 million workers from coal miners to solar engineers in 163 countries. What is one of the many unique things about Sharon is that she's not only a labor um, leader, but she's been a climate warrior and activist for many, many decades. And she understands better than almost any human being the importance of a safe and fair and just transition as we move off of a fossil fuel based economy to a clean and sustainable energy sector future. Um, she was one, Sharon was one of the people that exerted intensive pressure on the officials that were writing up the Paris Agreement in 2015 that made sure that taking on business and governments to commit themselves to just transition, making that a reality for people. So this is a real treat that we have Sharon who is in Brussels at her home right now. Uh, partly because of the coronavirus, yeah. working from home. Um, my first question to you, Sharon, is how did you get involved as a climate activist? You, you come from Australia. Um, t tell me how you evolved into being a warrior for the climate. Well, I think that I had an environmental consciousness because I was a teacher. And uh, in a previous life, a long time ago, Jane, and uh, and indeed, you know, as a labour activist, I used to actually stand with local people and bring the local uh, union leaders along and the members when trees were threatened or our parks were threatened. And so, you know, that kind of gave me a sense of how important our environment is, both in terms of the pleasure it brings, but also, of course, in a, a very dry continent the actual role it plays in terms of uh, our greener uh, pastures. But then in 2000, when I was actually elected as ACTU leader, the leader of the Australian uh, trade union movement, I read my first IPCC report and it was like reading a horror story. And, you know, I not only accept the science, I'm a teacher, but in fact, it was sort of like, Oh my God, it was just that wake up moment. Wow. And I could see that for workers, this would be the biggest systemic change that we would face. Of course, it was both an imperative to do it for the uh, sake of sustainability and the planet for human beings themselves uh, needed to be, uh, the, the system needed to be changed to make it a living planet. But it was also about jobs and the way every industry, energy first, but every industry, whether it's heavy industry in terms of manufacturing or construction, or indeed uh, transport or even agriculture, which is sort of had to be, uh, these industries had to shift to different technologies or we had no chance of actually resolving the climate issue. Right. Now, that of course came with a whole set of oh moments like oh how do we do this how do you give people a sense that this is so important when they're struggling day to day for safe and secure workplaces for just wages but we had to start and indeed we fought the battle amongst our own ranks to actually get commitments to initially two degrees and now of course net zero by 2050 which gives us a fighting chance of getting to 1.5 so that's the start of it. And since then, of course, I've seen all of the pain, the terror, 
the fear people have about losing their lands and their livelihoods because extreme weather events are already devastating work and uh, homelands for people. But indeed then the threat of secure jobs, good union jobs actually going because of the need to shift the technology, whether it's energy or other, other industries. Since you've talked about extreme weather um, and we've had, or you've had, you were, you're Australian, um, these, these apocalyptic fires in Australia. Um, just within the last few days, we've learned that it has now been proven that the fires in Australia are climate change related. Um, how do you think that that's affecting the labor movement in Australia and the political scene in Australia? Well, the debate about climate for people has shifted. It's not about something that will happen in the future. It's something that's already changed. So first to see fire and then floods. We've seen it before, but it's been more isolated. You know, one patch of fire devastating for individuals and families or indeed livestock and, and nature, but usually one area at a time. And floods, again, usually localised to one state or one set of... Uh, um, cities or communities, but this time it's been everywhere. Every state in Australia was on fire. And for those of us who are very far away from our families, it was incredibly frightening. I can't tell you as much as we care about everybody's family. When on New Year's Eve, my own brother's family was like literally two or three minutes away from being annihilated, except for an amazing southerly on their beach community that came up and blew the fire back on itself. I can't describe the terror of that. I can only share it with others whose families are in the same uh, situation. And now floods. People are now losing their homes and their livelihoods again because of floods. So the climate is, has changed in Australia. It's changed in many, many nations. Changing seasons, if not extreme weather event devastation, means people don't know how to manage their lives, and particularly in terms of security of income, and that means, of course, uh, work, decent work, whether it's direct employment or you're working for yourself or your community. It's absolutely a, a, an imperative that we move fast and we do it, as you said, with just transition, and that means for us, that the measures to support working families, to give them hope that there will be secure jobs, decent work, that those are designed, including them and their unions, wherever possible. So you've touched on just transitions. Uh, can you, first of all, explain to our, to our viewers what just transition means? Just transition is a very simple idea. We've seen many transitions and I was reminded of one today in terms of the, the manufacturing downturn in the uh, 80s and 90s where people simply lost jobs and communities were devastated. But we want to do this differently. It's on such a massive scale that you will get resistance. It's human nature to fight if they're frightened. But if they have hope and they're involved, then that will shift. And there's simple measures. It's guaranteeing older workers secure pensions. And you've just seen the fight put up to secure minors' pensions in the US. That was a major outcome. But in every industry for older workers, we need to make sure their pensions are secured. We need to make sure for younger workers that they have the hope of secure jobs, of the, the support to develop new skills and indeed where it's necessary and they need redeployment in other sectors or industries, the income and the redeployment support that enables them to know they have a future. And we need renewal in communities. You know, I work with uh, companies that uh, actually don't walk away when they're closing coal-fired power stations. They actually want to see what they can do to invest in a future for the community that's given them the profit, but it's hard work, Jane. And we, we are almost out of time. So in the next 10 years, we have to reduce emissions by 45%. That requires all of us. It requires every industry, every sector, every workplace. 
And this year, on June 24th, we're actually challenging employers, our workplace uh, representatives will ask their employer to actually have a conversation with them about how they together climate proof the workplace. That means reducing emissions, but it means what's the plan for jobs? What's the plan to sustain that business and that uh, impact on, on the community and their families for the future? So we have to take it from demanding Governments Act this year, one year, 2020, is a critical year to get governments to put up ambitious, uh, they call them NDCs, their contribution or commitment to the global challenge. What are they going to do to get us to net zero by 2050 and 45% by 2030? What's their targets? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, we need every business, every workplace, indeed the conversations with unions and, and workers, but community as well because we're all in this together. Yeah. So how much resistance are you finding among governments to sit down and have this discussion about putting in place just transitions? You know, our governments, I mean, we're seeing shrinking democratic space right around the world. Right. We're seeing a, a shift in the extreme right giving workers false hope. And you've seen it in the US, you know, we will get your jobs back. We will save your coal uh, jobs. These things are not helping. It's painful. You know, I walked the coal fields. Most recently, last November, I walked the coal fields in uh, a community just uh, near Leon in Spain. And the coal miners are passionate. They're angry. They've built profitable communities. But they're also committed to their own environment, to their, you know, their bushwalkers, their mountain climbers. And they want a pristine environment for themselves and their children. And they know the only way to do that is to actually harness that passion into what will be the future, where will be the jobs, what will be the industry. So with agreements like the Spanish agreement around just transition, and in Spain we have one of the world's most uh, um, humane and uh, courageous environment ministers, in, uh, in Teresa, and she actually, Teresa Rivera actually is so committed to this that now we have to take some new steps like a just transition authority to channel funds, but that's a success story. I know you've talked before about Germany. I could tell you about the just transition uh, commission in Scotland. I can tell you about workplaces and indeed the 80 employers who signed up to work against uh, US withdrawing from the Paris Agreement just before the uh, climate conference last year, but also agreed to sit and join the dialogue with workers around fundamental rights and just transition measures. We've got to build on that. Every workplace that cares about its workers and their communities has to be at the table with unions and where it's uh, vital community representatives. Can, can you kind of walk us through the process of what happened in Spain that led to such a, 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 a fair and um, far-reaching tra just transition plan? Well, it's an interesting story because, you know, if you go back to just uh, as I was taking over this job in 2010, then Teresa was actually an, an advisor to the Spanish government a progressive government that had actually given the union funds to develop a, uh, an, a campaign around climate and work. And that's where we, we built the Just Transition campaign from. We'd actually campaigned for it for over 10 years before we got to the Paris Agreement in 2015. And of course, that's what campaigns are. But she was an advisor and was in fact a champion then. Then they went through a period of pretty devastating government uh, austerity and changes of government uh, political uh, colour. And finally, when her government, and she was then a minister, was in power, in the last three years, she's actually built the commitment to a just transition agreement. And what's really fascinating is it's not only the workers who trust Theresa and because they've been part of the agreement, as much as they're anxious, about themselves and their children, but it's actually the employers as well. 
I've been told by energy leaders, particularly those investing in renewable energy, that in fact, that this minister has given them more certainty, she's done more for industry policy in the energy area in the last few years than they've seen in decades. So it works for everybody if you get it right and if everybody's at the table. Would be is has anybody written up what's gone on in Spain? Oh yes, it's actually there, and uh, and we did a small uh, little folksy, but a documentary for the BBC last year. But uh, indeed, it's really a story we can tell. We can give you the 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 agreement. We can uh, document the the stories of workers and their comments and their views. And the passion that I can tell you is not easy. But you have to be able to actually talk to people in an honest way. You have to be able to absorb their pain and their anger without denouncing them because yeah. that's real. That's very real. And it's our job as union leaders and union representatives to actually take that passion and harness it into the kind of agreements and then the support for those agreements. So now we've moved on a little and we're calling for just transition authorities wherever we can get them because yes it's about coal but it's also about the transition from now all fossil fuels it's not the the problem is not the fossil fuels themselves it's when you burn it and so there are companies for example that are harnessing co2 and then turning it into other products based on uh, on carbon but we need that circular uh, economy approach, a circular production approach, whether it's in your city, whether it's in your company, or whether it's indeed uh, more broadly around the world. So it brings in all the issues of trade and what the trade rules are, what you do about investing in industry policy and then protecting your investments with border adjustment uh, capacity. But it also brings in what is our responsibility to share the technology that we know works with poorer communities. So we don't again leave the poorest of our countries way behind. Yeah. We've still got a long way to go to think through at the local level, how we move this much quicker, but then at the global level, how we make sure everybody's included. And frankly, I'm very, very, well, I'm angry actually with many, many governments because they're still cowered by corporate interests they are not thinking about uh, the reality that we're not fighting to keep a living planet underneath us for human beings. They're determined just to follow the dictates of the short-term profit interests of existing corporations dealing in industries that are harming our environment. Yeah. We want the industries, Jane, and we want the jobs, but we want them to transition. Yeah. Well, we know a lot about governments that are in the in the grasp of corporate interests here in the United States. We're hoping that by November we can change that. Well, I'm optimistic about Europe. It's tense, it's a difficult time, but the EU Green Deal has at its core, not just ambition, but just transition. Yeah. And so people, whether it's the more progressive employers, whether it's ourselves as trade unions, or indeed whether it's governments, People are coming together with NGOs who are driving a, a, a progressive future. Mm -hmm. And we're saying we've got to make this work. Yeah. Now, tension around the budgets and there's tension around, uh, you know, how you get the laggards in to get the, the levels of ambition. But you know what? I can live with that tension because the conversations are there and the commitment is there. So yeah. you can find the solutions. It's where we can't get to the dialogue table, like in my own country. Can I tell you a tragic story? The, fi the, the fire chiefs asked to see our prime minister six months before those fires or more, and he refused to see them. And when they released their concerns, then it was absolutely what happened. If you trust working people, they know, they know what's gonna come down the track. So whether it's predicting the, the solutions to, to prevent fires or whether it's actually what do we need to sustain jobs or how do we build new jobs, everybody has to feel like they've got a stake in this and they yeah. own the solutions.
Yeah. It's one of the things that I've learned during the months that, that since we've started Fire Drill Fridays and we've had so many frontline voices at the table and so many indigenous people speaking, I've really realized how if you want solutions, you've got to talk to the people on the ground whose lives have been totally caught up in what makes things work. How do you save the environment? That's why the indigenous voices are, are, so, are so important. And in Australia, the, the Aboriginal voices have been for so long trying to say, this is what you need to do to prevent these massive fires. Is anybody well, going to start listening now to them? Well, for many decades, of course, our Indigenous people, and I'm talking centuries, really, our Indigenous people actually managed fire as a way of uh, restoring the environment. Right. And, of course, while this is bigger and more ferocious than that was ever um, foreseen, nevertheless, their wisdom, again, has to be at the table. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. But, can, but can I tell you that, you know, there are there are things we can do immediately. Workers have power, they have pension funds. We have $37 trillion of our pension fund money invested in the global economy. We have already delivered uh, with a partnership with Harvard and the London School of Economics and uh, the Principles Responsible Investment, which is a UN uh, um, agency. We've actually delivered with the ITUC, uh, a commitment to a just transition investment brief and $11 trillion of that money signed up. Now, we're going after the rest, but we also now want to see them implementing it by demanding the simple demands of their companies. Are, do you have a just transition plan? Are you committed to net zero by 2050? What are you going to do in the next 10 years to get to almost half of that commitment? These are the real things we can do, even while we're waiting for the shocking uh, lack of leadership in too many of our governments. Yeah, we've, uh, we've just launched in the United States the Stop the Money Pipeline campaign. Bill McGibbon, the co-founder of 350.org, who was very much part of the original um, divestment um, strategies, which was of course then carried by the youth climate strikers. There's been a big divestment move here in this country. And I think $12 trillion has been already taken out of the banks and the insurance companies and the money marketing funds that have been investing and, and enabling the fossil fuel industry. We're pulling that money out. And uh, you know that's one of the critical arms of the um, the people who are fighting against climate change. We have, to, we have to cut the money off that's enabling the fossil fuel industry to profit. And, right. but you know, again, if these companies were serious, they have the resources and the technology to actually transition. If you take an, a Norwegian company like, uh, um, it's now called Equinor, <laughs> but was known as Statoil, then in fact, their offshore wind platforms uh, uh, offshore uh, oil platforms that can now be turned into wind platforms. The technology that drives the supply chain that's actually because that's where there are critical jobs can be turned around. So instead of a pipeline, you know, actually piping oil, you now have a, commission, a, a, a capacity to take uh, renewable energies and put them through pipelines to other communities. So it's not the pipeline that's necessarily the problem, it's what's the source of energy? And are these companies making the transition? Because there are so many jobs in those industries. Yeah. But if they don't, of course, we say divest. But we do say, use your money to, to you know, give them the incentive to transition, or otherwise, of course, you'll have to divest over time. But where those companies, can actually move. And I'll give you a very practical example. Aviation, difficult, absolutely in dire straits at the moment with the uh, coronavirus as it's known, but COVID-19 then, you are actually, um, uh, they actually have a commitment, at least a dozen of them, to get to net zero by 2050. So to change the face of the aviation industry. One third of that could be delivered with fixing by, by changing the jet fuel mix 
could be delivered virtually overnight. The technology is proven. But will our oil uh, companies change their jet fuel mix? No. Why? Because they're making massive profit. So they're relying on startups, small startups com companies, brilliant, heroic, tested the technology, but it won't be fast enough if those big companies don't ship. So there are things they can do if we push them that mm. doesn't require them to go out of business. Mm. However, there are so many laggards in the industry that ultimately the investors themselves and the market will determine, you know, that they're no longer viable. Well, more and more of, of the companies are becoming less profitable. You know, there was a recently, I think it was um, February 23rd, tech resources industries in, in Alberta, Canada, withdrew their permit request for what would have been the largest tar sands mine in the world, um, twice as big as, as uh, Greater Vancouver. Um, it would have gone through Boreal Forest. It would have destroyed so much of the environment. And Two, it was a two-prong reason why they quit. One was civil disobedience on the part of the indigenous communities and their supporters who shut down transportation in that part of Canada. And the other is it just wasn't profitable. Mm. The money didn't make sense. So the more that we can pull our money out of banks and, and pension funds and insurance companies, et cetera, that are funding fossil fuels. And the more we can slow down their ability to get their permits, the less profitable it's gonna be for them. So, you know, there's a hero of mine, um, a union leader in Fort McMurray in Canada, one on the biggest there. oil sands that you just talked about. And he actually tells the story that just makes you cry about how he went through the devastation of the manufacturing um, downturn in the 80s and watched whole communities die and his family had to relocate and so on. And he's then in Port Murray, a really good job, union job. And he says, and you know what? We have to do it all again. But this time, let's do it differently. Let's see whether we can shift the technology, the know-how, the investment for clean and green futures, but bringing workers, finding the jobs for them, rather than devastating our communities all over again. And that's the message. We say, if, if you can actually have a look at what's possible, I'm confident any company that really wants to transition can, Jane. The problem is too many of them don't. I've been reading lately about companies, large, very large companies that are going green, that are building uh, huge wind turbine farms and things like that, but they don't allow their workers to unionize. Yes. And they're creating just as much havoc as, in a way, as the fossil fuel industry. So, mm -hmm. you know, that says to us that it's not, it's not just, the fact that it's green, it has to also be pro-labor. Absolutely. So and you I'm know, wondering, you know, all you the way, take, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say, if you take a good unionized job in, uh, in say coal-fired power stations and turn it into a renewable energy job, it's still an energy job. The problem is if it's paid half the rates, if the security is not there because they're on contract work, then in fact, that's going to actually damage the trust that we need to build that secure future. Mm -hmm. So we have European companies who are offering a dialogue with American unions because they're investing in offshore wind in places like California, but also outside of New York down into uh, uh, Jersey, New Jersey, et cetera. So that's what we've got to do is put the unions, put the investors, put the companies together and make sure that the transition to those jobs, one source of energy to another, still energy workers, means that you've got good union jobs. Now, of course, in the US, you have a huge problem because the employers, the American Chamber of Commerce, their biggest fight is still against workers unionizing. And of course, the fundamental heart of democracy is freedom of association. 
but your laws are stacked against American workers and the attitude of corporations who feel like they can bully, harass, do whatever it takes to, uh, to frighten workers from joining a union is just wrong. It's actually morally wrong, but it should be against the law and they should be persecuted because without freedom of association, we have no fundamental freedoms. So the US has several fights on its hands. One is for a progressive government, Jane, please. Really important for the world. Second is, of course, for labour laws that actually uh, mean workers can join unions and, uh, and collective bargaining can help with both inequality, but also these measures around how you manage transition in all sectors. And the third thing is, of course, to see workers have the trust that those rights are there for them to actually, uh, you know, have as a, as a basis. What's the biggest advice you can give the climate movement in the United States um, that will help us bring labor together so, so, so we can work for uh, reducing our fossil fuel emissions by half in 10 years? What, what's your advice? Talk to workers. Even where it's painful, talk to workers, find common ground. Most people, particularly where it's localised, care equally about their communities. Mm -hmm. But if we take sides and we come down on one side or the other without a common goal, then we will divide communities and we won't get this job done. Mm -hmm. I, about five years ago, I, uh, I did a briefing for my staff and it was called Welcome to My Nightmare because we had seen it happen first at the, uh, the COP in Poland where the first one in Warsaw, where in fact we had 500 climate activists about to actually be uh, the target of about 5,000 coal miners who out of fear for their future were going to walk uh, in parallel to the climate activists. And of course the tension around that was enormous. And so I sort of woke up and went, oh goodness, we own both these. These are members, all of them. And so we have to find a way to talk within our own communities. But then equally in Germany, before we got that agreement, there was this infamous Sunday that by working with the climate uh, groups never happened, thankfully. But we were again about to see parallel marches. But we learned to talk to each other. In fact, going into the Paris Agreement discussions, the, the major climate groups globally, the major development groups, and the trade union movement were united for both human rights and just transition, but also mm -hmm. for the ambition of the climate uh, agreement itself. We have to replicate that everywhere and people shouldn't be frightened of passion or anger or conflict. You have to have the skills to work through that because mm -hmm. that's human. Being a human being is messy, but being fearful without any hope, you just get angry. Mm -hmm. We've got to get through the anger and look for the solutions. And that yeah. means we all, both labor and the environment groups and governments and employers, we all have to learn to talk to each other and to find the solutions, which won't be overnight, but they can be much faster. That 10 years can be a reality to yeah. get us there in all industries to 45% reduction with yeah. secure jobs, with decent work, but it will take all of us and the commitment yeah. that all of us can bring. And it's, you know, un until you have an example on the ground to say, we've done it. This wasn't just words, we've actually done it. It's so difficult because workers have been through so many transitions. You know, there was the, the tr transition when the trade, you know, the free trade uh, agreements started to happen. There's, they're going through transitions now with, with robotics taking over some, there's a lot of transitions and they've never come out on the good side of the transitions. It's always been bad for workers um, up until now. So when we talk about a just transition, what I hear from labor leaders that I've met with is, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, we've been here before and we've heard the promises and it's never come through. So we, we in the true. United States, go ahead, yes. 
No, that's true. That's absolutely true, which is why we have to be so determined to demand a different approach this time. Now, I'm not going to pretend to you that we'll get it right in every case, but we have to do everything we can. Just saying this won't happen because it won't be just, rather than taking the fight up to whoever it is, to our investors, to our, our employers, to government, for a just transition, because we know that the very uh, crisis of extinction is actually extinction of human beings. If we're no longer here, the planet will run clean. It will heal itself. But meanwhile, our very own uh, survival depends on us acting. Now, that is not an easy task, and it will not be without tears and without pain. But you can only cut through the, the opposition and the anger if you actually include people. And that's our message. Bring people to the table, look for the solutions, and don't simply listen to the corporations who don't want to act. Work with the corporations that do. I saw you cut up your Chase Manhattan card. I thought it was such a brilliant moment because if these banks, you know, don't want to come on board with uh, climate solutions, that they, they want to continue to invest for maximum profit, then that's got to change. And the only way you're going to change it is to take on the resistors. We will be very tolerant of those making a, uh, a choice to take the transition, but failing along the way. We're all going to fail at various points. But the real challenge is to say, what did we learn out of that? How do we get beyond that and, uh, and build for success? Yeah. Um just for for listeners who are not super familiar with the with the specifics of just transition i'd like to get a little granular with what happened in germany for example because um that's something that i know that i've learned from uh, samantha smith who um you know who who was part of that fair transition as you know the just transition in germany where, well, you can explain it better than I, when 20 or 30,000 coal miners have been transitioned into new jobs. So can you explain very concretely what exactly that looks like? Some people retired, some people got new jobs in different sectors. What, ha what happens while they're being trained, blah, blah, blah. To tell, take us through that very concretely. Well, first of all, the retirement uh, uh, of older miners often required a gap, a support in the pension gap. So it might be two years, three years, four years, five years, but until you're at pension age, what can you do to make sure that those who choose to retire, and it should always be done by choice, who choose to retire have an income base on which they can live with dignity in that third phase of their lives. The second set of issues is, of course, in the time you have left as you're transitioning out, how do people, uh, how do you guarantee those workers their jobs? And how do you then look for the alternate jobs that are uh, possible? If you take a small community I worked with in Australia, then the community, the unions, the young uh, climate activists were all on board. It's a community called Port Augusta in the heart of the desert. It's a gateland uh, to, uh, in fact, uh, Australia's interior, to desert country, which in itself is magnificent, but it's not very productive. But when the community got together and they said, well, we've got two coal-fired power stations here. What are we going to do about that? Then there was this brilliant uh, woman who was a leader in the community who was actually the wife of a unique thing in Australia called the Flying Doctor Service, where in remote locations, the doctors fly in planes to their patients because there's no clinic down the road, uh, you know, where there's 100 or 200 people in a small community. And they decided after a lot of research that the closest thing was in fact to build solar thermal. Now, not only did their feasibility study actually build a small plant as a result, but it actually showed that from that small plant, first of all, the technology was quite uh, um, compatible. You needed to do some reskilling, but a combustion engine is a combustion engine. And then, of course, 
they also discovered they could grow vegetables in the desert in hothouses from uh, renewable energy. So they sought investment to actually make the transition before the uh, coal-fired power station uh, owners shut down the, uh, the stations. Now, and so the workers would just transition. Now, there was a gap. I'm not going to pretend to you they got it perfect. There was a lot of pain because suddenly overnight, the, uh, the company shut the coal-fired power station, not as they promised five years to eight years in the future. However, it's now up and running. They've got new investors and that community will survive. So this was one about workers, not quite perfect, but there will be jobs in energy there. And, uh, and of course, a survival for the community. That's what we're talking about. It yeah. is about the workers, absolutely, that's my job. But it's also about jobs in living communities where the hope of a future is there. We don't want all our people to simply pick up and move somewhere else. There'll be some of that. We're not, uh, you know, we, we, there's no Pollyanna approach to this, but where we can sustain jobs, sustain communities, sustain companies, then that's in all our interests. So it seems to me that the healthcare component of this is, um, is something to look at. You know, here in the United States, our healthcare is, benefits are tied to jobs. So if you mm -hmm. lose your job, you lose your healthcare. Mm -hmm. In Australia, when, is it different if, yeah. if, it, if it's a, a, it's, it's like Canada and indeed yeah. Europe. Healthcare is for everybody. Of course, where you are uh, in work, then, uh, you know, in Europe, for example, you're part of a mutual. But no one not in work, he would be denied healthcare. In Australia, our Medicare system is universal. And I'm proud to say the trade unions fought for that. In fact, as a very young teacher, it was my first national strike that I went on to save the Medicare system in Australia. It was then called Medibank. But uh, the Canadians have done it time and time again as well. They've defended their Medicare system. And it's about uh, pharmaceutical support as well as uh, affordable health care for everybody. Now, I'm not telling you these systems don't need some improvement. They do. But compared to what you know, I think you have 40 million people or something without health care. That's a tragedy. And that has to be fixed if we're going to make these transitions, but also just the general health of communities and mental health is yeah. exploding in all of our countries with the stress of a life that's too fast, with family breakdowns or atomized families around mm -hmm. the world, with the refugee issue as we see more and more you know, people flee from, uh, yes, conflict or economic desperation, but now in increasingly climate. And, you know, we try not to deal in the uh, apocalyptic kind of future. But if you look at the melting of the glaciers in Antarctica, then it's my part of the world, the Asia Pacific, that will be faced with not half a metre rise above sea level or a metre rise above sea level, but potentially over time, six, seven, eight metres. And you know, in Bangladesh alone, let alone in Laos and Vietnam and all the other low-lying countries, but in Bangladesh alone, 30 million people live less than half a metre above sea level. And that's such a populated uh, country. They either have nowhere to go or they have no agricultural land. So either way, it's a devastation, but the climate refugees will grow. And if we can't sustain what is a world that can afford to look after its own people, you know, we're three times richer, Jane, in the last 20 years as a world than we were, uh, you know, in the 90s. And yet since the 90s, both labour income shares gone like that, yeah. formal work in terms of direct employment that's secure has gone like that. People have forgotten about central bank mandates for full employment. So we have a convergence of crisis. We have inequality at an all time high. We have the climate imperative. We have the technological shifts. Some of those will be necessary for climate, but others uh, are simply about the future marching on that you've talked about. And of course, there are some big ethical considerations there as, w as well as work related considerations. And then we have the very crisis of work. 60% of our People are in informal work. No rights, no minimum wage, no rule of law. We have to redesign our economies. 
yeah. and indeed the way in which we think about a shared future. Because if we don't, then ultimately all of those risks are simply going to erode more and more of our security, whether we're middle income or wealthier. And uh, that's the reality. So we have a choice. We have a choice about climate. Tough, painful, but we have a choice. Have a choice about inequality. Same deal. What choices will we make and what power will we exercise at the ballot box where we still have the privilege to vote? Yeah. So we are at, we're at a moment in human civilization. It's the first time that human beings have ever been in this situation where we, we can make the decision that we are going to do what's necessary for the survival of our species. And in the process of addressing this climate crisis, we can heal all the other ills of society. Those two things can go together. That's what the Green New Deal means. And it's been, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, Sharon, because you as a, an individual woman embody the hope of the future. You are a labor warrior and you are a climate warrior and those two things have to come together. And I'm just so grateful that you've talked to us about the places where it is happening and it's happening beautifully and successfully. And the fact that you feel hopeful fills me with hope. So thank you so much for being part of this teach-in. Thank you, Jane, and thank you for your leadership. And thanks to our young people for their fight for the future. But the ITUC campaigns are, in fact, that embodiment, the three frontline campaigns. It's about rebuilding our democracies so they're accountable for people. It's about the building of a new social contract to deal with inequalities and uh, the way in which work is secured, the uh, capacity to join a union and bargain collectively. And it is about, of course, the just transition we need to get to that ambitious level of action around climate. You're terrific. We love you. Please keep up the fight. And you have millions of people behind you. But together, we are, we are going to win. We have to win. By our powers combined. And we, do, we have to stay together. That's, that's it. I want to thank those of you who are watching this teach-in. I want to remind all of you that you can stay in touch with Fire Drill Fridays and follow what we're doing on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to uh, get involved with Fire Drill Fridays, you can text Jane to 877-877. Thank you very much.